My name is Melissa. Like I said earlier, I work for the American Lung Association and I coordinate the Cycle the Seacoast event. And I wanted to thank Eastern Mountain Sports for doing this presentation on winter activities today. So Cycle the Seacoast, what it is, normally it's a one day ride and it usually happens the first Sunday of May every year at Cisco Brewers Portsmouth with a 25, 50 and 100 mile goal. This year, we decided to make the event virtual for everyone's safety, and I'm actually very excited about it because we did a virtual event last year as well, and I was able to participate. I ended up signing up for the 100-mile goal, and basically what that means is I can complete that all in one day, which I did not, <laughs> or I can do it little by little. So I'd get out on my bike um, between my mountain bike and my road bike. I'd do like 10 miles, five miles, and eventually it added up to 100 miles, which was really kind of cool to see. So that's kind of how it works. You would pick your mileage goal and you can certainly exceed that if you were to start riding, let's say tomorrow on your indoor bike between then and June 30th, you'd probably exceed your goal. Um, so there's real no strict guidelines on that, but it's just a fun way to set a goal and get out there and ride or stay inside if you're more of an indoor spin bike person. I personally am a mountain biker more than anything, so I like getting my miles on that. It's also a great way to support um, an organization that is fighting COVID-19 as well as many other things. Um, that's top of mind right now. And it was really fun last year to see everybody come together in support of an, the organization and the mission. So I'm really excited for this year. You can sign up at any time at cyclethesecos.org and I will chat that in the chat box as well as my email in case you wanna to talk to me more about it and learn uh, about the options. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean Hayland with Eastern Mountain Sports. He's gonna be talking to us today about all things winter activities. And again, any questions you have, just chat it right in the box and we'll make sure to ask at the end. Go ahead, Sean. All right, thanks Melissa for uh, kicking that off. Uh, thank you all for uh, watching our presentation here. We're gonna go over a little bit about winter sports. Um, it's been a great winter to get out there. I know uh, the ski resorts have been really packed. Um, a lot of people are finding extra time and desire to go play outdoors in the winter, which is excellent. But today we're going to go over a couple things. Uh, we're going to start things off with some snowshoes, go over a little bit about uh, the type of snowshoeing, where you can go snowshoeing, um, clothing on what to wear when you go snowshoeing, some stuff to pack, uh, a couple tips and tricks that I use when I go snowshoeing, and then we can dive into some skis. I've got a couple skis here with me. We'll go over the type of skis, uh, sort of the uh, type of skis and which type of terrain you'll be using them in, as well as the boots and stuff like that. And then to finish things off, I'll go over some uh, winter camping stuff as well. So to kick things off, we'll go over some snowshoes. Uh, so with me here today, I got a, a range of snowshoes here, um, starting over here with this Cubs Glacier. So this is gonna be an excellent snowshoe for you know, those entry level users who are looking to just, just try out snowshoeing, just trying to um, see what it's all about, if they're gonna enjoy it, that sort of thing. It's a wonderful snowshoe for snowshoeing around here. As you can see, it's, it's pretty basic, not much to it other than you get your platform, your deck, as well as your binding system here, which features just a minimal ratchet system. Really easy to get your foot in and out of that. Not much fuss going on here. And you get minimal traction as well. Nothing crazy, um, but it's enough that'll get you around on the local trails. Um, it's a great option for the local stuff, like I mentioned, especially the flatter trails, the rolling terrain, especially the places where you don't really get a lot of technical hills and climbing, that sort of thing. You probably won't be using a snowshoe like that out on the mountains, um, just because you don't have quite as much traction as some of these other options here, um, as well as some other support in the binding that you get in some of the more advanced snowshoes. A snowshoe like this is usually starting at around 150, and they usually uh, work their way up from there up to about 250 to 300 mark on the higher end of things. But for most people, this is gonna be plenty. Um, next up in the lineup, I have a Tubbs Mountaineering snowshoe, where this is gonna feature a little bit more of an aggressive crampon system. They call 
the spikes here, the traction points, your crampon. And essentially what the crampon is doing is providing that grip on the snow and the ice. And as you can see here, just comparing these two, you're going to get much bigger teeth on the uh, crampon here on this purple one than over here on this red one. So a snowshoe like this, it's going to be excellent for those um, people that are looking to get on some of the bigger hills, some smaller mounds, and even some of the, uh, probably some of the smaller 4,000 footers and stuff you could certainly use a snowshoe for. Um, some of the features that you find in this next sort of step up from the basic snowshoes is a better binding system. So the binding system is going to be a lot easier to get your foot in and out. You can um, kind of, just, you know, pull on these tabs, get your foot in nice and easily, as well as pull on these back straps. So it really makes your experience really streamlined when you're out there. You know, you're really focused on getting out there and enjoying your experience outdoors. You don't really want to fuss with the binding system. So it's a great choice. Uh, with the step up from the um, tub, say this glacier, for example, you also get a feature that is called a televator or a heel lifter. And this flips up here. Basically what this does is it creates a platform for you to stand on. So imagine that you're going along some flat trails, right? You don't necessarily need this up because your snowshoe is working uh, with your natural gait, your movement. And as soon as things start to get Deep or you know pointed uphill, and you can look up the trail and see. Oh yeah, this hill goes on for quite some time. Uh, now is a great chance for you to flip up your elevator. And what this is going to do, it's going to create a level platform. So if you would imagine the snowshoe is on the side of a slope, it's going to look something like this. And what that elevator does is it keeps your foot nice and level. So it's going to actually alleviate a lot of pressure and fatigue off of your calves and your leg muscles so that you can climb those hills a little bit longer and a little bit easier. Um, and you're not gonna work, have to work nearly as hard to do so. Moving up from there, we go into more of like a mountaineering snowshoe. Um, these snowshoes are gonna offer even more traction than the previous one that I mentioned here. You're also gonna get like this one, you're gonna get more aggressive crampon system where you have these, um, it's actually stamped into the side of the snowshoe. It's a metal frame construction versus the tubular frame of a um, entry level and an intermediate snowshoe. So the more advanced snowshoes, you get nice stamped rail where they actually cut out teeth along the side of it. So you're getting essentially 360 degrees of traction. And uh, this is an excellent choice for someone that's going to be doing a lot of winter hiking and they need an option for when the snow gets deep. Say, for example, you're up on um, the presidential, you know, the ridge lines up there, the presidential mountains, for example, Pierce, Eisenhower, or excellent winter hikes. Um, this is gonna be a great option. It's nice and lightweight too. It's a little bit lighter than these other options, hence the, uh, you know, more expensive price range on these, but you are saving a ton of weight um, really simple and easy to strap this to the side of a backpack, for example. And like the others here, they have a really nice lightweight and uh, simple binding system. Keep everything in check. And you also do get the elevator on these as well um, for that mountain terrain you may be experiencing. So these are great options. Um, we also got some, uh, you know, great kit options too. Um, can't leave the kids at home. So showing too fun for that. So. Like I, like I mentioned over here, pretty basic snowshoes for kids. They don't want to mess with anything too complicated. They just want to go out there and have an experience. So you get a quick little ratchet system in and out. It's that easy. Um, as far as poles go, a lot of people use poles when they go snowshoeing. Uh, it's not in a, um, necessarily a have to. A lot of people opt for having poles though. It's, it's kind of like hiking, if you will. You get that extra support. Um, you can actually take about, I believe it's like 15% of your body weight off of your feet just by using your poles properly. Uh, you also are able to stabilize yourself a little bit better. Some of those trails, even though you're wearing a nice snowshoe, sometimes even an aggressive snowshoe, sometimes that snow is a little bit on the loose side. You might slip a little bit, might slide, usually run into ice, especially up in the higher elevation. And that's exactly where these poles come into play. So you can stabilize yourself a little bit, 
Um, it's going to work just like if, if you were hiking a hiking pole. In a normal hiking pole, though, you might notice that um, on the tip of this pole here, you have what's called like a three season basket, like spring, summer, and fall where this is going to be great, you know, those trails where the dirt is a little bit softer, maybe some mud. Um, the, the whole pole isn't going to be sinking straight through it. It's going to stop about here. Uh, and this is really all that you need for those warmer times of the year. But when it comes to snowshoeing in particular, you oftentimes get yourself out there when the conditions are a little bit softer. Um, it's pretty common, actually, for, um, you know, you, if, if you were out in the white, for example, and uh, the trail is looking great and packed out, um, a lot of people have been out there previously with their snowshoes and broke the trail up for you. Even then, it's pretty common to find snow drifts that can be up to knee high or even way steep sometimes, even if people have been out there before. Um, so it's great to have an option that's going to stay above the snow. If you can imagine, you almost have like a little tiny snowshoe on the front of your pole here. And what this is doing is it preventing that snowshoe from sinking, or the pole, I should say, sorry, from sinking too far into the snow. Um, really, really great upgrade if your poles don't already include these baskets. It'll make your life so much easier when you're actually out there. And uh, some of these poles, too, um, they're going to have a series of adjustment points on them. Most of the time, it's going to be a flick, flick lock system, where with a flick of a switch here, you can adjust the, um, the pole to your desired height. A good rule of thumb for getting your snowshoe adjusted correctly is that if I was hiking with my snowshoe, I like to have my arm parallel with the ground here. So right now it's a little bit on the high end of things. So I can go ahead and flip that switch down, drop it a little bit, check it again, and that looks pretty good. A lot of times people will extend it when they're going downhill and shorten it when they're going uphill, um, just to keep that arm parallel with the ground, if you will, if it was, if you can imagine a flat surface. Um, the poles are also gonna include a strap over here too. I'm gonna shorten this just to make it a little bit easier. So the strap over here is really nice uh, in the sense that you can actually use the strap to, um, really optimize the pole for its full potential. So if I was gonna be using this pole to go snowshoeing, I would come in, put my hand through the strap here and go underneath it. And I'd grab the pole like that. You see that the strap is kind of underneath my hand on my wrist. So that way, um, and even too, before you get going, sometimes people will wrap it another time and make it nice and, nice and taut there. And what that does is if you can imagine the uh, strap here is kind of putting tension on this um, on my wrist, underneath my wrist here, going through the strap into the handle. And it's actually trying to pry the pole out in front of me. And what that does is it's going to help the pole kind of kick out in front of you so that you're working a little bit less. So um, when you're moving the poles out in front of you, it's less likely to get you tripped up. Um, it's a lot easier to kind of put some snow off that way too. And it's just an overall better experience than if you were to just grab the handle like this, for example. Um, I really like using my strap to make a huge difference, huge difference. And you can go hands-free if you needed to, to grab something real quick. So that's about it for uh, poles. Uh, they come in all sorts of, sorts of weights, sizes, uh, shapes, colors, whatever fits your needs best. I also like, um, say, if I was, you know, spending out a spending a day out in the say White Mountains, out snowshoeing or I guess hiking, um, hiking like winter hiking, and I'm bringing my snowshoes with me. I like bringing a set of accessory straps or something like that. Um, there's often times when you don't necessarily need to be wearing your snowshoes, so you get to a section of trail, it's broken in, things are kind of icy. Maybe I just want to put my micro spikes on. This is where having a nice set of accessory straps comes in. And uh, you can take usually your snowshoe and um, stick it on. Each backpack is different. That's why I don't have a backpack. won't really go over that too much, um, just because they're all different in how you can configure your snowshoes to them. But it's usually a matter of sticking one um, either on the sides of the backpack or 
underneath, say, the brain of the backpack like that, if you have a, a top piece for your backpack. Or sometimes people will just stick them right on the back of it. Uh, so that, you know, kind of covers it as far as carrying the snowshoes. Again, accessory straps are wonderful to have out there. Uh, they also make a really quick and easy, say, um, your bindings start to come undone or something like that, something breaks out in the field. It's always good to have some repair kit and stuff like that with you. On that note, I can go over um, a little bit about first aid kits too. Uh, if I'm usually, you know, close to home, um, just going out there for an hour or so, a couple miles, I usually, you know, opt for leaving some of the accessories and stuff at home. But when I'm out there for, say, a day of snowshoeing out in the wilderness, usually off to attacking a lightweight first aid kit, which is going to include all the essentials and stuff like that to keep you and people that you're with safe and stuff like that. Another great thing to have out there is hand warmers and toe warmers. Um, hand warmers are great. I like, uh, if I'm going out there for a couple hours and I know it's going to be cold, um, I like to bring a couple pairs of gloves with me. I'll usually bring a really, really lightweight, breathable glove. And then I'll also bring a glove somewhere in the middle of the range between uh, dexterity and warmth. So a good, a good glove if you're just kind of working on some flat terrain. And then I'll also bring a pretty heavy duty glove too. Um, and usually with the heavy duty glove, I'll put some hand warmers into them too ahead of time. So that way, if I run into the situation where I'm out there and man, these temperatures are dropping, it's really getting cold out there. Um, I can just put my hands right into that bigger glove and I've already got my hand warmers ready to go. Um, makes the glove nice and warm and uh, nice, nice welcoming experience putting your hand into that glove after, you know, those thin gloves maybe aren't working out for you. And likewise, some foot warmers. I usually, um, I usually hold off on these until I start to notice the, the cold on my feet. Um, Having a properly, you know, insulated winter hiking boot, not really a big deal. Um, always good to have in the backpack, though. Um, I usually bring a couple Nalgene's with me. Um, any sort of basic water bottle will do. A couple of tricks with water. Um, a lot of times people run into the issue where water will freeze when you're out on the trail, especially in colder temperatures, is to store your water bottle upside down in your water bottle holders on the outsides of your backpack. That way the ice will freeze from the top down. So no matter what way you've got it configured, ice kind of works its way down from the top. So if you were to think, you know, water bottles upside down, the ice is going to start down here and you're still going to be able to open that water bottle up and drink and stay hydrated out on the trail. And another thing to look out for too, um, especially with water bottles have you know, threading and a screw off cap is making sure that this water sort of cleared out around the threading of the water bottle and cap. Um, I run into this issue all the time where the threading starts to get a little bit wet and it'll start to freeze and the cap will freeze on. So a nice trick for that is just, you know, you finish your water, you're done drinking, you get ready to put it back in your backpack. Just give it like a good couple uh, quick blows of the mouth and um, kind of clean off any drops of water that you've seen built up around the threading. And that way you can ensure you're gonna have water throughout the, um, your snowshoeing experience without it being all frozen up on you. Let's see, what else do I got here? As far as what to wear on your feet when you're up snowshoeing, you get a lot of questions about, um, are these boots gonna be warm enough for me? Are they gonna be good for snowshoeing? And uh, I, I usually opt for something like this. And um, you know, if I get a friend asking me, uh, what footwear to use when they're up snowshoeing. I usually opt for a uh, just a basic winter hiking boot. It's all that you need out there um, for most people anyway. This is a great example by Obos. Um, this is going to feature 200 grams of insulation, which is kind of your first tier as far as insulation goes in a, in a, in a winter insulated boot. Uh, the next step up from that is like a 400 gram insulated boot, which is a great option for those ice fishers or people that are going to be doing less aerobic activities out in the winter. Um, it's a warmer boot, therefore you don't need to be moving it around as much to keep yourself warm. Um, when you're out hiking or snowshoeing, it's 
it's it's pretty common to build up some heat when you're moving, especially if you're going on mountainous or hilly terrain. So you don't quite need the 400 uh, grams of insulation for most people. A lot of people are pretty happy with the 200 grams of insulation. So this is usually what I'm um, what I'm using out there in the woods when I'm on my snowshoes. And uh, a boot like this is great too, in the sense that you have this is like a little D ring it's called up front here. And if you get a gator which is another piece of, um, I guess, protective material, I guess you'd put over, you know, your boot here. And uh, it's essentially going to keep the snow from going into the boot. And it's, it's kind of notorious snowshoes here to kick up snow. They're kicking up snow constantly when you're out there using the field. So by having that gator on and uh, rope through this D-ring here, does an excellent job of keeping the snow out and your feet nice and dry. Um, another really nice feature I like about, you know, a, a winter hiking boot like this is you have a little bit of a lip to the heel of the boot, and that's going to provide, um, you know, something to put the back of the strap on, the back of the snowshoe around. It's going to sit nice and snug, and it won't slip off or slip down the back of the boot here if you've got it properly adjusted on the snowshoe. And it's also going to help out with your gator as well, kind of, you know, giving it that um, surface and that spot here to, to stay put and take care of you out in the field. When I'm out there snowshoeing, um, I usually just wear, you know, clothing that I'll be comfortable in for the temperatures. It's usually just like a, like a winter hiking, um, um, you know, clothing. So, you get your base layers, right? Something like a smart wool merino wool base layer would be an excellent choice starting things out on. And uh, I usually go base layer, top and bottom. Um, I love a good base layer. I think it's great um, having a good layering system in place. Over my base layers, especially on my lower body, I'll usually just opt for a lightweight, weather resistant, water resistant, Pant that's going to provide some stretch and breathability. What you don't want is like a, say like a rain pant where it's going to trap in moisture. So you're out there and you're getting warm, you're moving around, you're working up a sweat. You want something that's going to wick moisture away from the body. So that way you're not sweating. Your, colds, your clothes will get wet if you sweat and you end up getting cold. So by having the uh, base layer with a nice sort of weather resistant um, pant over that, is a great way to ensure that your legs are going to stay nice and uh, warm and dry. And then on my upper body, after base layer, I'll go with like a mid layer, maybe like a thin um, fleece or something like that, for example. And uh, usually, you know, you're working around the trails, maybe going up some hills and stuff like that. You don't really need a huge down parka, for example. Um, unless it's really, really cold out or you're somebody that's prone to being cold easily. I usually go for something like this, where this is going to be insulated. It's going to be warm. Um, it, it's going to be not too warm, though. Like I mentioned before, you're not really going to sweat tremendously in something like this, unless you're, you know, working up Mount Liberty out in the white where it's a uh, consistent incline for a good portion of the trail. I like to be able to adjust layers. And I like to be able to keep myself cool when I need to, but also keep myself warm. Um, and that being said, sometimes if it is on the chilly side, I will bring an extra outside layer, say like a down or synthetically insulated um, puppy jacket for when the temperatures drop. Um, and I'll usually just keep it in my backpack and uh, take it out whenever I need to. I'm going to go grab a backpack and show you kind of what I would use for a day out um, if I were to go snowshoeing. So this is a nice option. Um, if you were to go, say, snowshoeing out for a couple hours, say, the local woods, um, this is a wonderful, you know, lightweight, easy, simple, small backpack that I can put my straps, say, if I wanted to bring a first aid kit, maybe some food, uh, water, hand warmers, that sort of thing. Um, really great option, you know, any sort of hiking backpack will do, like a small capacity one anyway. And the nice thing about this is um, a lot of the hiking-oriented backpacks have the ability to use 
say a hydration bladder with them. And uh, the hydration bladders are a good way to stay hydrated when you're out on the trail, if you were out snowshoeing. Um, the only drawbacks to having the bladders is they're sometimes a little bit more finicky when the temperatures get really cold, but there are a few tricks that you can do to help keep your system flowing smoothly and uh, you being able to hydrate yourself. So if I was out there, you know, between maybe 20 and 32 degrees, you know, it's cold enough for water to freeze, but it's not necessarily really, really cold. Um, you could certainly use a bladder for that. And the way that I would do it is I would use the bladder as, as usual, you know, fill it up with how much water you need, whatever else you might uh, want to include with it. Some people like to put the flavoring tabs or electrolytes into it as well. Um, sometimes the added uh, sodium and electrolytes and stuff can actually help it from, um, it, it'll slow down the freezing process just by a little bit, um, but everything helps out there. And another trick I like to do too is Say you're coming to an intersection on the trail and you think, um, oh, this is you know, a wonderful spot to sit down, or maybe not sit down, but stop and have a, a drink and some snacks. Um, is if I start you know, drinking out of the, uh, the hose and the, um, the, the tip here, you can um, actually back blow up through the hose. So you're done drinking, you actually give it a good blow. And that's going to flush the water back into the hydration bladder. And you want to do that enough until you start to hear like bubbles or gargling um, at the end of the hose. That means you've flushed out all the water in the hose. And the reason for doing so is your hose is going to be uh, more prone to freezing than the main bladder itself. So the, the, little, the little narrow hose here, not very um, insulated by itself. And especially the nozzle as well, a little bit prone to freezing, but as long as you can clean it out um, and remember to do that, you'll be in pretty good shape. They also make insulated sleeves to put on over the hose, which is a great option too if you are out there and it's a little bit colder, say it's below 20 degrees. Um, great way to ensure, you know, your stuff's going to stay nice and uh, liquid, not a block of ice. That's never fun. All right, so I think that's, that's all that we got for uh, snowshoeing. Um, why don't we dive right into skis? Got a couple skis here I can go over. All right. So similar to snowshoeing, people have different preferences on how long they want to ski for, um, where they want to go skiing, and the type of skiing that they want to do. So to start things out, I will show you, uh, this is a Fisher Voyager Crown. Um, this is an excellent choice for you know, there's groomed Nordic centers where they have a grooming machine that will set a track in a groomed trail for you. Um, this is, you know, your Bretton Woods, your Jackson ski touring facilities. And the reason why this is such a great option is that it's gonna be, you know, pretty budget friendly. You can get out there and uh, have a good good time, good weekend um, on not a ton. And, you're going to get some nice scales going on the bottom of the snowshoe here, which is going to give you some grip for those kicks and those inclines. In a ski like this, you don't really get any sort of edge to it. But then again, um, it's not really meant to, you know, make some turns in some rougher snow, some crusty stuff. You're really you're oriented towards those tracks. For the users that want to do a little bit of everything, comes a touring ski. This is the Fisher Spider 62. And the upgrades that you get from the Voyager here is that you get a full metal edge to the ski, a steel edge, as well as an off-track crown. So you're going to be able to do some climbing um, and descending with this ski. It's a great 
great option. I've actually owned one myself and I've been a big fan of it. You kind of think of it like the mountain bike of skis. Like it'll basically go anywhere and you can do a lot with it. And that's a great option um, for this local area in particular. You know, we get this free saw cycles on the seacoast. So if you're looking to get out onto a pair of cross country skis, that's another good um, an option for you. I know things are getting kind of slim this um, season, especially as we near the end of the season here, as far as selections on skis and stuff go. But uh, certainly something to keep in the back of the mind if you're interested in skiing. Um, maybe start looking for some touring skis for next season. And that brings us over into the backcountry category. So these backcountry skis are going to feature a lot wider uh, platform and surface area. You get better flotation out of a ski like this just because of its size. And this is going to be a good option for those lesser used trails out in, say, like the White Mountains, um, where you're going to be doing some significant climbing and descending. Uh, you can actually put a climbing skin on this ski to give you an idea of how you know, aggressive you can get with the terrain. It's still going to feature a binding that's going to let your heel come off of the ski as any other uh, cross-country ski um, boot and binding system would. But you're going to get a lot better, you know, flotation out of the ski like this. You're not going to be going to the Nordic tracks with it just because it is so wide. But it's a wonderful area if you're looking to escape the crowds, if you want to kind of cut your own trails, get away from, um, get away from, you know, the popular Nordic centers for a little bit and uh, see what you can find out in the wilderness. So with that, uh, a couple different boots. So a basic triple N, N and N uh, boot is a great option for those Nordic centers. You get your lace up system with a zipper, nothing too fancy going on here, but all that you really need for those grooved uh, track centers. And if you were to go for, um, say, one of these touring skis, like the, the narrow edge skis, the metal edge, you could find yourself in a touring boot. And a touring boot is going to feature um, the same triple N toe bail as the uh, boot I previously showed you. The benefits of a boot like this is that you get a little bit more of an anchor supporting system out of it where you get the straps going on here, uh, as well as a built in gaiter. So what this is going to do is it's going to keep the snow from coming into the top of the boot and melting inside of it, keeping your feet um, wet and not very happy. So get your boot on, get it all laced up, and you can pinch down on that and uh, keep you nice and dry out there when you're out pouring around. And last but not least is a, uh, this is what a backcountry boot is going to look like for you kind of like the touring boot that I just showed you as well. Um, it almost looks identical. The main difference between these is going to be the toe piece, where you get a reinforced toe, um, toe bar, which is going to work with the reinforced and wider binding system. And that's going to give you the control and leverage that you really need to um, uh, not necessarily carve, but steer, stop, kind of work in some rougher terrain. Um, they're all going to be waterproof, they're all going to be insulated, very warm choices. Really just depends on where you're planning on going and what kind of skiing you're doing. Uh, the bindings are all a little bit different. If you were looking at um, skiing locally and uh, skiing at the Nordic centers, you're going to be in like the triple N bindings, um, which are pretty narrow, pretty narrow toe piece here. Uh, nothing too crazy, you can adjust these forward and back. Uh, which is a great option if you want to get better glide or better climbing performance out of these bindings. Moving into uh, the backcountry binding, you usually get um, an option or two. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see, it's a little bit of a minor detail, but the toe piece is right about here. This is going to be a little bit wider, a little bit more rigid than the system here. And like I said, it's going to match up great with that beefier boot to give you the stability control that you need to handle some of those rougher trails. Um, the, I guess, big brother of this one is the even uh, wider system, not necessarily a different toe piece, 
but as you can see, the surface area on that plate is a little bit bigger. And uh, that's just gonna really optimize um, your input throughout those boots into the skis. So if you've got a narrow ski, go for the narrower, you know, triple end binding and stuff like that. It's gonna suit you great for doing stuff around here, the local golf courses, the Group Nordic centers and stuff like that. If you're a user that's really trying to go cut some tracks, um, backcountry system is an excellent choice for you. And uh, a lot of the skis that you find on the market these days are waxless skis. They don't necessarily need um, wax to get you moving. They have that awesome sort of fish tail crown on the bottoms of these. But you can apply wax to your skis, and I encourage um, folks to do so. Um, you get, for example, I get my wax here, for example. You're out there in the snow is getting a little bit sticky, maybe sticking to the bottom of your skis, or you're looking to get a little bit more of a performance uh, glide out of your ski. You can apply some glide wax. And all this really does is it creates a surface on the bottom of the ski that um, increases the friction and it just helps you move along. This is a great little, you know, sponge and wax system where you just kind of dabble your sponge in here, you kind of buff it onto the bottom of the ski. I usually coat my skis, you know, if I'm planning on spending a couple hours out on my skis, I usually do a quick little layer on each ski before I head out. And you want to do everything other than what's giving you traction. So you aim for the top or the tip of the ski here and the tail of the ski as well. Um, what happens if you put the wax on the tails, it will actually gum up the tails and you can actually um, hinder your climbing performance that way. So I don't encourage anybody to apply wax to those scales necessarily, but everywhere else is fair game and you will notice a significant difference uh, once you get everything waxed and ready to go. Um, let's see, what else we got here? Um, ski poles are all gonna be, you know, they're kind of similar to the sense that you're using a pole for, um, you're, you're, you're pushing off the ground with them. They're kind of like a trekking pole or a pole that you're gonna use for snowshoeing. However, people usually go for a longer pole. Um, a dedicated ski pole doesn't really have any adjustment to it, but you really get um, a nice sturdy system to really drive the power through. I don't have one to show you, um, but getting a nice uh, pole, especially for the touring and backcountry sort of realm of things, having like, a true touring pole is going to put you in good shape. Um, a lot of the uh, track skis and the track poles are a lighter weight package. So I would just encourage you to aim for um, a beefier, sturdier pole if you were looking to get into some of the backcountry stuff. That's all that I got for skis here. And uh, I'll dive right into some winter camping stuff in just a moment. So I recently went on a trip up to Maine uh, where I did some skiing and winter camping. I actually, I climbed Mount Katahdin in the winter and um, it was about a five mile ski in and a five mile ski out followed by a night under the stars in Baxter State Park where I did some winter camping. And there's a few things that um, are different about winter camping than say summer camping. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's all pretty similar. It's just going to be a lot colder, especially out here in New England, obviously. Uh, with that being said, I can go over uh, some of the sleep systems that you can use to keep yourself warm at night. So staying warm and comfy is you know, one of the most important things when you're out there in the winter, um, you know, you, hypothermia is a real, you know, concern. So keeping yourself at a good temperature constantly when you're out there is going to be a key thing in keeping you happy and safe and uh, enjoying your trip. So we got a couple of sleeping pads here that I can show you. 
And uh, sleeping pads, um, they're all kind of rated for uh, different uses and different temperatures. They're kind of like sleeping bags in the sense that you have your summer sleeping bags and your heavier, warmer winter sleeping bags. So some of these sleeping, um, yeah, sleeping pads are going to be rated for winter temperatures. And they all kind of follow the same system um, by using what's called an R value. So the R value is basically the thermal properties of how warm the pad is going to be. Um, it's basically how much it's going to insulate you from the ground and how warm it's going to keep you. And your, out, um, your R value is going to be uh, found on a scale between one, or I should say zero, all the way up to I believe nine at the high end of things, nine or 10. So on a scale from about zero to 10, um, you can find anything from say a two over here. I think this is a four or so, a 3.2. And then over here on my left, I have a 6.9. And the nice thing about our value rated products especially the sleeping systems, um, is that you can actually add up the R values. So for example, if I had a three season uh, sleeping pad like this one, you know, this is a pad that I'm going to be using uh, fall, uh, spring and summer. I don't want to, you know, necessarily go buy another one for winter, but I can go out and get a, an additional uh, foam pad. And I can actually combine these. So the R value over here, the 2.1 can be combined over here with my 3.2, getting me up into uh, the range in which the winter pads are rated for. So usually with the warmer sleeping system, you find R values of about two. So by itself, this will be adequate out in the summer. This is like a 3.2. Yeah, so this by itself, you know, they call it like a summer and shoulder season sleeping pad. So you can use this in the spring and fall uh, as well as the summer. So this is a great versatile option. And then if you truly wanted to spend time out there in the winter, say you were doing some winter camping out in the whites, um, or even if you were going on some mountaineering trips or traveling in colder climates, having something that's a little bit um, higher than like say five on the R value scale, it's gonna keep you nice and warm. This is a seven over here. So really great way to keep you um, warm and happy when you're out sleeping. And like I said before, co combining these two is a great option. Um, you usually put your, your foam pad down on first. That's gonna ensure that you're not, um, you're, you're kind of protecting your sleeping pad. Say there might be some debris some splinters if you were in a lean-to, um, or if there's some rough stuff on the ground, you can really protect your sleeping pad by putting your foam one on underneath it. And it's even a good idea for the, uh, even the warm one here too, not necessarily for the sake of, you know, providing warmth, but for protection as well. So with the sleeping pads, you usually want to pair it with a nice uh, winter sleeping bag. So a winter sleeping bag really isn't going to be all that different from, you know, your summer, spring or fall sleeping bag. Um, there are a couple things that are different that I like to look for in a sleeping bag uh, in particular. So you were thinking of spending some, um, some time in a tent during the colder months of the year. I like to get a sleeping bag that's going to be a little bit colder rated for the temperatures that I expect to be in. So for example, if it was going to be 32 degrees, I might opt for say a zero degree bag like this one here. That way I know for a fact that my sleeping system is going to be um, warm enough to keep me happy that night. Because it's never fun, you know, waking up cold. Um, there's some tricks and stuff to keep you warm throughout the night if you wake up cold, but when it comes down to it, you really got to get your, uh, your sleep system dialed in. One feature that I look for in these uh, sleeping bags is having a drawstring around the hood here. 
this is going to close up that sleeping bag around your face and uh, really kind of sealing off any, any way for warm air to escape. Um, so those are kind of the two bigger things that I look for is having a warm enough sleeping bag that's going to be um, usually lightweight, compactable, um, and it's also going to have the features that are going to keep me warm too, you know, being spacious enough for uh, myself and even maybe storing some clothing in the sleeping bag to fill it up a little bit. And then having, you know, your drawstring around the uh, hood here. And uh, you'll be in good shape. Another thing, too, and a trick that I've recently started doing, um, if I were to go out winter camping and you're trying to save a little bit of weight, but you're also trying to maximize warmth, if you go for something like a sleeping bag liner, and uh, what a liner does is it's actually kind of like a sheet that you'd almost put on the inside of your sleeping bag. It's like a little tiny uh, sleeping bag that will go inside the sleeping bag. Um, they're very thin. They're, like I said, it's almost like a sheet-like material, but they actually do a surprisingly good job at keeping you a little bit warmer. Um, each, each liner is going to be a little bit different. They're all going to come in different temperature um, ratings, which are going to add temperature um, factors to your sleeping bag. For example, this one here is going to be um, potentially adding up to 14 degrees of warmth to a sleeping bag, which when it comes down to it, that's, that's a lot of warmth right there. That's enough to make a significant difference and a difference that you usually uh, notice when you're out there winter camping. They're really, really lightweight, about the size of, you know, softball when you got it all compact. And uh, they really don't fill up too much room in a backpack or even if you were, say, car camping, just toss it in the back. And they usually come in like a nice little stuff sack as well. So they're easy to take care of. They're also going to provide a nice sort of barrier between you and your sleeping bag. So that way you're keeping your sleeping bag cleaner. Um, they also wick moisture away from you too, so your sleeping bag can be drier. It's just overall a really um, nice additional piece of gear to have when you're at the winter camping. Another thing that I recently acquired um, to accompany uh, my gear and sleep system on my trip up to Baxter was a sort of like a sleeping booty. Um, I was out there using primarily my ski boots for when I skied in and then my mountaineering boot when it came time to climb the mountain. Um, but to fill in the gaps, you know, there was some downtime at camp. I uh, got myself into a, you know, like a down booty like this, which is going to give you a little bit of traction on the bottom. So you've got some tasks to do around camp and you've already taken off your hiking boots, your ski boots, your mountaineering boots, and the, the boots are cold. Uh, you don't really, you know, feel like lacing them up, tying them back on. Um, you can just get yourself into something like this. And this is going to be a nice, sort of lightweight, easy to store. Um, some of them are even smaller than this as far as compactability, but like you can shrink that thing right down, you know, keep it in a backpack, what have you. And this is great too for, you know, those um, pit stops in the middle of the night if you need to get up and use the restroom or something like that. You can pop right out of your sleeping bag and get yourself into a boot like this without having to bother with lacing up anything. Um, you just kind of, you know, put your feet in and go, and it's, it's that easy. Another thing too uh, about winter camping is the um, the colder temperatures are going to add some strain on your uh, cooking abilities and your um, I guess you know ease of making food. So having a um, a stove that's going to be a little bit on the windproof side of things and a little bit more insulated is going to help you optimize your fuel as well as, um, you know, boil times and the time it actually takes to get water from a, uh, um, up into a boil to get your food going. I really like this option by MSR. It features a protective um, barrier around your burner and your actual, um, I guess, pot here. So it's gonna take less time to boil the water than a stove that doesn't have this. And by having an insulated pot here too, it's gonna um, 
keep the water warmer for longer. And it's also going to be much more easier on the fuel consumption. Um, people are often surprised at how quick they're going through fuel when they're up there with the camping, just because it's a little bit more intensive on the stoves. Um, and I always remember to, you know, bring some backup fuel just in case. You don't want to get into a situation when you're out there trying to cook dinner and uh, you run out of fuel and, you know, you bring something like a dehydrated meal and there's no way to hydrate it other than to leave it in some cold water. And at that point, you know, you run into, oh, my food's going to freeze because I don't have anything to warm it up. So bring enough fuel with you, you know, get some insulated stuff, um, even like an insulated mug. It's a really great option to um, put your put your freeze dried food in, and then your boiling water. You put the cap on your insulated mug, and uh, your your food stays warmer longer, and it rehydrates a little bit better than if you were to just put it um, if you were to put the boiling water right into here. These these get cold really quickly up there in the colder temperatures, and uh, these are wonderful too. I really like bringing these out there with me, especially in the colder months. Um, you know, if you were out doing some winter backpacking or something like that, you really don't want to spend two hours making an elaborate meal at camp. You just want to, you know, get to camp, have your meal, and uh, get cozy in your sleeping bag for the night, staying warm and dry. Um, another thing about food, too, is it's a great idea to, uh, and this is, you know, true across the board, no matter if you're skiing or snowshoeing is that eating a little bit more that day, say that morning while you're out there and at night, especially winter camping, um, by having more fuel, more food in your system, your body's actually making you a little bit warmer. Um, the process of you know breaking down the food generates heat. So by eating a little bit of extra food, um, you're doing yourself a favor. You're staying a little bit warmer. Your body's happier. You're probably burning more food Anyway, just because of the uh, the temperatures in the activities that you're doing. Uh, for example, that night that I spent under the stars in Baxter State Park, I I brought a couple of these with me, and I had about probably I think I had about 2,000 calories of food that night. Um, that was fuel that I needed, uh, fuel that I had burned skiing in, and that was fuel that I needed for um, keeping warm that night as well as fuel for the next day. So ensuring that you bring enough food um, will take care of you out there. And uh, that's that's pretty much all that we've uh, got to cover here today. Wow, um, that was awesome. Thank you, Sean. Of course. That was very informative. I personally have really only snowshoed. I haven't done the other things. So it was really great to hear about that. So I just wanted to remind everyone if they have a question, um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask or chat it in the box. We have about five minutes. So if you have a question, make sure you ask now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Sean a couple of questions that I had. Um, I've never cross country skied and I live in Maine, so it's kind of weird, but I have downhill skied and I'm just curious, like the feel of the boot, the difference. I just, I don't love the downhill ski boot. It's so rigid and it hurts my everything below the knee. <laughs> how, how does it compare to a, a boot for cross country skiing? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, for all those cyclists out there, you could almost picture that boot is going to feel kind of like a cycling shoe in the sense that it's a little bit stiffer than, say, a running sneaker or something like that. Um, there's just a little bit more going on underneath your foot. Mm -hmm. However, they're, they're not stiff. They're uh, pretty flexible. Um, I've actually driven in my cross-country ski boot, if that helps you kind of um, envision what it's going to be like on your foot. They're really easy going. You can walk around in them pretty easily. Uh, they are just a little bit clunky, though, underneath all the plastic and stuff. Well, that's good to know. That makes me want to try it now. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, another question I had, um, would you suggest if somebody has never cross-country skied or snowshoed that they maybe try renting it first to give it a go before they buy it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great way to make sure that it's, um, you know, a worthy investment. A lot of this stuff isn't necessarily cheap. Um, so it's a great way to try out stuff before you buy. 
And that way you also get a little bit of experience under your belt as well. Um, with, with that being said, you know, maybe you go out uh, skiing at one of the Nordic centers and you say, I don't like these tracks. I don't like the stream stuff. I want to go to the backcountry. Then you're more informed when it comes time to make that purchase. And likewise with the snowshoes too. Um, just kind of figuring out things before you commit to it. Absolutely, great question. All right, yeah, great. Cause I think I might do that with the uh, cross country skis. Um, so I thought the most exciting part of your discussion was uh, your story about Baxter because I've been to Baxter, not in the winter but I've been recently seeing a lot of people post um, about doing the winter camping thing and hiking to the top and it kind of blows my mind just it seems like so much effort because you have to prepare everything and obviously be in shape to some extent. And I mean, what do you do for safety out there? I mean, you're going to go with a group probably, but what happens if something happens that like you can't, there's no service, right? You can't call. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And probably the most important question about, you know, doing anything of that nature is just how are we going to protect ourselves out here? How are we going to be safe about it? Um, so there were a, a few things that I uh, made sure that I was doing before uh, embarking on a journey like that. Uh, first, I was kind of making sure that everybody that I was going with was kind of all um, on the same page as far as experience experiences go. You know, you want somebody that's knowledgeable and has experience in those uh, environments, those cold mountainous environments. So, you know, I was checking in with my friends, my, my small group. It was just me and two others keeping it small, um, making sure that, you know, nothing was overlooked. You know, hey, how are you doing? Do you have all the proper gear? Hey, how, did, how does your sleep system look? Are you going to be warm enough, do you think? Um, just, you know, checking each other, uh, making sure that we were all in you know, good shape and we were prepared, and had a plan and everything like that. Um, and then also having a plan, we, we laid out sort of like a framework of how the trip was going to go. We were going to ski in, try to get to camp at this time. We were going to leave at this time in the morning and get back um, or try to get to the summit at this time too. And also having plans for when things don't go to plan. Mm -hmm. So say we were out there and we were just moving really, really slow. And, you know, we, we looked down at our watch and, oh my gosh, it's, it's two o'clock and we haven't even gotten near the summit, you know, accepting the fact that turning around isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a, it's a good decision sometimes. So, so having those plans, um, sticking to plans and having backup plans for when the ideal plans don't go to plan. Mm -hmm. um, that and just bringing the proper stuff to, like we, we spent about a month going over the details on what to bring. Um, we needed, we even needed like reservations for that trip in particular, mm -hmm. but you know, making sure that you've got your proper crampons, ice axe. Um, we had two garments with us as well. So despite the lack of self-service, we were able to communicate to um, help say if something went wrong, we could, uh, we, could, we could cover ourselves out there as far as communication goes. So making wow. sure the people you're going with are up to speed, your gear is up to speed and you've got a plan. Awesome, that's great. Uh, I think that's all I have for questions, but I just wanted to wrap it up with a quick recap of the Cycle the Sea Coast event in case anybody missed it in the beginning. Um, so the Cycle the Sea Coast is a fundraising event for the American Lung Association, and it is a 25, 50, or 100 mile ride this year being virtual. So you pick which mileage goal you'd like to do, and you cycle between now and June 30th. So you don't have to do it all in one day. You can break it up in months if you want to, and you can do it on a road bike or a mountain bike. And I will be participating. It will be a lot of fun. If you're interested in learning more or registering, you can visit cyclesecos.org. And it is benefiting the American Lung Association, which is currently fighting COVID-19 along with a, a number of other um, research and advocacy projects. So thank you so much, Sean from Eastern Mountain Sports. That was such an amazing presentation. I feel like I learned a lot and it was really nice to be with you guys tonight. And I will talk to you later.